Stephanie, I'm so excited to have this conversation with you to share, you know, this time space, this virtual time space that we are creating a bridge from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And I feel like we covered so much territory the other day. I wondered what was left to talk about, you know? <laughs> well, we're going to go deeper this time, darling. Okay. All right. And um, this is the official conversation for posterity. So this will live forever All in right. the annals of the internet. Um, I've been such a fan of your work as a jazz vocalist and as an artist. I've known of your work um, for many years. I know that you were in New York at the kind of peak of the East Village 80s scene. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm I so- that. I was even part of Wigstock, the first one. Really? All of that stuff. I knew Taboo and all those kids and, and Happy Face and, and Bunny and all those. Yeah, I was part, would you believe I was part of that? I do believe it. And was that because you spent time at the Pyramid Club on Avenue A or was it? That... It was because I qualified to be part of that scene as a trans person. Mm -hmm. As a trans person, that meant that I could be part of the show. Yeah. And I was. Yeah. But it was it was a tremendous experience. But just just because it gave me access to um, that entire culture. Yeah. Yes, a Saturday night that you couldn't get in that place. It was just packed. It was amazing. Ethel Eichel Berger. You ever hear of these people? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm a big. I'm a huge history fan, so I follow these many illustrious figures from the past. Mm -hmm. Ethel Eichelberger was just, for anyone who doesn't know, an incredible performance artist who played yeah. the accordion in drag. And she was, how tall was she? Could you paint the picture for us of an well, Ethel Eichelberger? Was that that was, what, six, two or something, three? Mm -hmm. There were so many people that passed through the pyramid at that time. Yeah. Yeah, the village was it was just wide open. I don't think we'll ever see that again. It was <laughs> unique. It was like a night blooming mushroom that appeared. And then after a few years, it all vanished again. Yeah. What did it feel like um, finding your way there, finding, you know, kindred spirits, finding people like you? Well, let me say this. <laughs> Finding kindred people like me. I I always felt as though I I was not legit. <laughs> Even though I was technically a member of the LGBT community, um, I wasn't exactly gay. I, I had long since had surgery. I it it, it it's it, to this day, it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to find the rubric to put me under, by virtue of the fact that I had surgery fifty years ago. Yeah. Oh, than most people are, are longer than most people. Are. <laughs> yeah, you've been a woman longer than I've been alive. Well, do do you know? I just saw something on the internet by Jermaine Greer that said that we're not real. We're not real women. And and I would like to ask Ms. Jermaine Greer, are you? <laughs> no, not, she's not, darling. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. No, not. She doesn't know the first thing about it. Yeah. But she's a real blast from the past, isn't she? In the sense that she represents this kind of rejection of modernity, this rejection of time moving forward and it's such a losing battle. It's so futile to dig your heels in and say, this is what women are. And you know, it's, it's, we're not living in a world like that anymore. And it's not um, up for debate. Well, let's put, it, let's put it this way. It's called an opinion, mm -hmm. you know, and everybody has one. <laughs> They're just opinions. 
things. Yeah. You know, her opinion of me doesn't define me. Their opinion of me does not define me. Yeah. Still, we come from a culture where we were defined mm. by our gender and by our sex and by our race and by our class. We were, you know, and these definitions imprinted our lives so deeply, you know? Yeah. They, they did. They really did. They defined who you are, where you go, what you do for a long, 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 long time. That's why this, they'll call it efflorescence of, let's call it gay life in the village was so critical mm. because everybody sort of came out, you know? Absolutely. How have you been defined and what is your journey to defining yourself? How did you, what's the kind of breadcrumb trail? of you feeling defined by the world. Because you can look at it from more than one point of view, more than one perspective. I have a photograph of me as a child, an infant in the cradle. And on the back of the picture, my mother has written my name and said, he was, he's a beautiful baby. And that's true, I was. So I have to think that I am, and I will not deny it. I cannot deny it. I won't deny it. But in some part, I am male. I mean, you can stick me under a microscope and look at my chromosomes and all this other bullshit and see that I'm quote unquote male. <laughs> and yes, and so I can't deny the biological aspect of my, my entity, my being. Um, and, and then again, it raises the question, well, how, in, how important is it for me to be uh, classified? How important is it how, how important is it that I fit into this binary system of male and female and good or bad or black and white and up and down and in and out? How, how important is that? And so now at the ripe old age of 79, I've determined that it's not, I mean, I don't want to be defined as a man just because I don't think I am, but I'm not entirely, uh, and on this one, I may have to agree with Ms. Greer, on this one, I'm not entirely a natural born female either. I think I'm a, I think I'm both. <laughs> I think I, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna be both because I think I am. I mean, I, I don't want, I don't want the people to have to take the women and move the women and children back when I walk down the street, but I think I'm both because I because I am. I benefit from both. I love the fact that I was a boy. I love the fact, really, I really do. I love the yeah. whole thing. Because I think the whole thing is beautiful. Just because I think it's beautiful. They just didn't have a place to put me. They had no place to fit me. So I found the place I thought where I belonged. Yeah. But I can't deny the physical, biological aspect of my life. I cannot. Right. And at the same time, I know that I'm not a congenital female, nor need I be. I don't want to be. I can't be. I can't. Absolutely. I mean, I'm with you. I feel <laughs> like I don't we, have to be that. Yeah, we are a confluence of all of the moments that we've had in this body and all of the moments we will have. And um, that and I think that most people on earth identify as a little bit of both. We all have feminine and masculine qualities and um, everybody is a completely unique self-created person. Um, it's certainly trans people who are always defending their identities and having to, you know, create rational frameworks around how we feel, but it's, I think, a microcosm of something that everybody experiences. But could we talk about you um, as a child, you and as your, um, in your origin story? And I know there's some photos that we could go through, but I would love to hear, you know, your story from the beginning and to uh. know more about um, Detroit in 19... 30. The 40s. 1940. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, I don't want to sit here and cry the little old pole black transgender blues. Okay. I don't. 
But at the same time, I have to hold into account the fact that I was born Black in America. Mm -hmm. Yes, they pull you out. And the first two things they notice is your sex and your race. Mm -hmm. and they did. And this is where I went. I went to male and I went to Black. And that defined the tone and texture and feel. It, it defined uh, the world that I, it defined the world that I was. Look, honey, this was before the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. You understand? They, they hadn't even taken down the signs yet that right. you drink at a fountain. And, and so I think what I absorbed, it, it was two things. One was that the, the, the incredible richness of the culture that I was born into. Mm -hmm. And to this very day, I remember every aspect of it. And, and we, we were extremely, even in Detroit, we were, there were places we could not go, mm. you know? So I, I grew up very poor, very black, very Christian, extremely musical. I, I think I, I I don't I don't think that I was I I never thought that there was a, that there was a female inside of me dying to get out. Mm -hmm. at, at no point did I ever use the metaphor of a woman inside trying to get out. Right. Although there are people who did it have that feeling, I never felt that. I rather I rather liked being a little boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I did. What's I did? Because I was. Um, I just think that I was more perceptive. We we didn't have any other way of category that kind of behavior in a child. Mm -hmm. Yes. I saw a movie on TV last night called something from the forties, and and Stephen Fletcher is in it. Okay. And and yes, and in the movie, Stephen Fletcher, Fletcher plays what else? A servant. And so he he is made, he is made to conform to a certain expectation of what black people are supposed to behave. Mm -hmm. And so the 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 the, 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 the rendition of his performance is that he's congenitally stupid. I mean, yes, he, he's funny, he's droll, he's accommodating. But this is kind of the mold that I had to follow as a black male person was kind of stupid because, because stupidity was required as in the movie to just exist. There was just no other place you could go, but stupid. To be non-threatening? Yes, to be non-threatening, to, no, to survive, mm. yes. Had he, had he for at, at any moment stepped outside of his role as a kind of fourth rate carrier, luggage carrier, he would not have been, he would not have been, his behavior would have been un, unacceptable. Right. And so I, le I, le I learned how to just really survive as a black male and in, all, and, um, in a black society. Yeah. And when did you find that art making, that music could be a space of freedom, a space of liberation, a space free of racism and misogyny and, and all that stuff? And all that stuff, eventually transphobia. Because the music was always there from the beginning. We had a piano as poor as we were. I had an aunt who played Debussy and Beethoven on the piano. So I grew up with the with music resounding in my ears. Music, music was always a profound, intrinsic part of my life. Yeah. But 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 still, there were people who there were people. My, the world that I lived in came to define my behavior as that of a, a sissy. Yeah. Because somewhere, somehow, I stepped outside the boundary of acceptable behavior for a little boy. I, I don't think I was feminine. I just think that I was the, the one trait that Stephen Fletcher was not allowed to portray in the movie. Just intelligent. Mm -hmm. 
It was the one thing that we were not allowed to be or to do. I think what I really was, I just think I was curious. Yeah. I became, yes, I was literate from an early age on. And that, that in and of itself separated me. Hmm. The femininity thing didn't happen really until much later. I was just, I was just categorized as different. Yeah. Just different. What did that mean to you at the time? That I couldn't join the others. That I could not be part of the rest of it. Mm -hmm. That I was somehow excluded or marginalized. And so I was, even though I don't think I was distinctly feminine, it was just too different, too different. But we, we are cast into these roles to play and most of us learn how to do it just in order to survive, you know? Yeah. And was it, do you, do you think being different was also the thing that propelled you out of Detroit to New York or what was that journey like for you? The thing that helped to propel me out of Detroit was my fucking library card. Yeah. <laughs> the library card saves the, the day. library card saved. <laughs> Go on. I was I was lit I was became literate very young. I had this imagination. I knew that there was more beyond the horizon that I could see. Mm -hmm. There was more to life than that. Yeah. Uh, favorite writers, favorite books. I'm sorry. What are your writers? Yeah. No, but I, but I was always found in in and maybe this is a cliche in the fine arts department. Yeah, Where yeah. else was there for me to go? You know. But now I look back. I I love it. I embrace it all. I love who I am. I do now. But it took me years and years and years. Self love, I think, is the the biggest uh, accomplishment in life and what is self-love self -love. yeah finding your way to loving yourself is it's, it's the biggest accomplishment it's hard earned you know we're, we're we are our own worst critics and we are very harsh uh judges when it comes I to our... we are and i am to this very day mm -hmm. i am and so who encouraged your artistic talent at a young age did you have mentors? Did you have favorite artists that you found? What were the things that the black your... community didn't really have much represent much graphic art at all? They were they were just musical geniuses. Yeah. There were very few black artists in, in that period that I had access to. None that I knew of. By the time I got to junior high, I was in the music department with a French horn. Mm -hmm. um, I had two years of high school and I love the way this thing works. Something happened, my grades fell or something and I was transferred from one school to another school, the, 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 lesser, the, the lesser prominent school across town. Mm -hmm. And it was there that I was first called Miss Thing. It, oh. was, it, was, it was there that I first encountered other gay people was in junior high, someone from the- Wow. They, they identified it before I did. And who called you Miss Thing? From the back of the biology class. <laughs> it was another queen? This, it was some queens in the back, where, where queens were and where, where, where queens are. And someone, <laughs> someone went, psst, psst, Miss Thing, Miss Thing. <laughs> and, I tur and I turned, and then turning to look back who said that, uh -huh. I was initiated. Isn't that crazy? Did they become a friend? Of course they will. Yes. <laughs> and, and the queen that I met was, called, was named Miss D. So for some reason, I was expelled from school. I think my grades fell or something. Yeah. Um, I hung out uh, for a while and ran into her coming out of an after hour joint one morning four in the morning and she says, what are you doing wearing boys clothes? You've got to come by the house. You got to change the way you dress. And, and so you kids today call that transitioning. Mm -hmm. And that and that began the transition. I, wow. I, I, 
We, I don't think we learn how to be women from congenital females. We learn how to be women from other trans women. At least I did. It, it was yeah. yes. And so, so Misty fixed you up. Yes, he said you have to go and you have to get a dress and some shoes and come back, and I did. And that began the whole process, what you call transitioning. Isn't that funny? Go so, on. What was that first dress that you bought? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was one I got from my sister. Okay. My sister's house, got her dress, got her shoes, came back. She put it on me. We were on Euclid Street. And that began the process. A year later, I was ready for the cover of Vogue. <laughs> I bet you were. Yes. I lost no time at all in perfecting that skill. Wow. And this is in the early 60s. Yes, it was. Oh. At 19, I dropped out of high school. So 1961? I can't remember the date. And then my father was dying. I went by. Yes, now I know. This is before, right before meeting Dean. Mm -hmm. I, I was studying dance. I got some money from my father. I went, got the $500 from the bank, went directly to the Greyhound bus station and went to New York, took the bus to New York City and enrolled in the Robert Joffrey Ballet School. Wow. Went and rented a room at the, young, the YMCA and went and applied for my first ballet class. A year later, he died. I went back to New York and that's when I ran into D. Everything, everything was a kind of preparation for the role I was going to play in life, I think. So from D, it all evolved. And about this time, it was possible to get a job working in a factory. Mm -hmm. I, I had the surgery at 26, somewhere between the time I got back from New York, meeting Miss D, three, four years evolved. Mm -hmm. And I'm working in the factory and I hear about the program at the University of Michigan for sex change surgery and the rest is history. Wow. What was queer life like in the 60s? You got a view of Detroit's queer life and then New York's. What, what were your observations? Well, well, no, nobody considered that queer life. Mm -hmm. it, didn't, it didn't have a term yeah. or, a name, or a name. It was just, here's what it was. It was undercover. Mm -hmm. It was very covert because at that time, you could be arrested for wearing women's clothes, right? And I remember being part of uh, some raids on after hour joints and they would take us all down to jail and they'd stop at a floor and they'd say, all right, who's a real woman and who's not? And all those who were would step out and they took the rest of us upstairs. Isn't that just in? <laughs> yeah, it really, it truly is. Um, it's and it feels, yeah. It must. It, it must. was so inhumane. Mm -hmm. It was just so inhumane. But it's all right. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I saw a lot. I what saw did you learn? This is going to sound absolutely frivolous. Okay. <laughs> yes, I learned how to create a female persona. Mm -hmm. I learned how to do my hair. I learned how to apply makeup. I learned how to pass. I learned how to survive. I learned how to get a job and work as a sort of non-entity at the factory during the week and on the weekends when I was off to put on my nice girl clothes and go out into the Black community and just survive. Yeah. And then by the time I'm 25, I hear about the program in Ann Arbor. At 26, I have the surgery and I go back to the factory. At 26, 27, I'm back at Chrysler. And this time they call me into the office and say, you know, we have to call you in here because we have to make sure that you don't use the men's restroom anymore. I worked there for a short time. And somehow I get off the bus one day and go into Wayne State University and I apply to go to school. You know? And so you went to school first in Detroit before going to Pratt? 
Yes, Pratt was a master's program. So I went to Pratt to get a master's degree. Would you believe I'm sitting here in her gallery? I went to Pratt to get a master's degree in painting. It was a two-year program. And it was something of a struggle because at that time in the 80s, New York City was on. I don't think we'll ever see that again. It was on fire. Yeah. So at some point, I laid down the brush and I decided that what I'm going to do is go into those clubs and sing. Yeah. I knew that I didn't want to stand before a canvas anymore. I wanted to stand before an audience. You know? Wow. And I can and- before before we get to your career in New York, I would love to just hear about being trans in the 60s. And, you know, I know that it was really encouraged for trans people to erase their history, to not to make up a plausible story of your life, to kind of tell a different version. Did you ever feel compelled to really um, kind of mold yourself into straight society? Um, And if you did, was it, did it feel short lived? Because you get to New York and you find, you know, a kind of urbane, queer counterculture scene. And, you know, it's not tethered, you're not tethered to those rules of straight society any longer, but what was that journey like from being, you know, a feminine queer person to like a woman? Well, here's the first thing you have to do. You got to go out and get a job. Mm-hmm. You have to find a way to survive and to support yourself. I got a job once at a place called, is it Fairway in New York City now? It's still there. Got a job at Fairway and on my lunch break, I would go upstairs and study songs, music. Yeah. And somehow, some of the, or one of the Black women that worked there clocked me. And she goes and tells my boss, who's head of the cheese department, that they've got a tranny up in there. Mm-hmm. And the next time I go back to work, the guy, the, the guy who was the assistant who was there in the department is furious. Just furious so I didn't stay too long what about he just felt the, the fact that I had somehow deceived him right because he had thought of me one way and then when he found out who and what I was it, it meant that it meant that the object it, his, it made him question who he was right and he didn't, he didn't like having to question himself. Well, if that, if that's a man and I was, a, and I was, a tra- and I'm attracted to her, what does that make me? And most men don't want to go. Most people don't want to go through that. Certainly not men. Men don't want to have to go through that. So I didn't stay too much longer. Yeah. Um, it was just a question of being adaptable, of being able to pass. Mm-hmm. It came down to being able to simply pass. Because for a long time, we couldn't, we didn't pass. We did, as they used to say back home, you you had to be able to pass the daylight test. And maybe that's why Chrysler was so important because in the factories, Mm -hmm. you didn't have to pass a daylight test. If you had a a, a five o'clock shadow or a deep voice or you weren't passable, you could go and get a job in a factory. Mm. Because a, a factory was not con- conventional society, not society at large. Right. That's how so many girls, so many trans people were able to live. Yeah. You were able to go and work in automobile factories that didn't care, where it didn't matter. Wow. And, and it didn't matter. And I'm forever grateful that that existed. Otherwise, yeah. we would have had to turn to the age old prospects of you had to you you didn't have for once we didn't have to go and sell our ass yeah and so there was other girls there at the factory there was other trans people there were other trans people there there were other trans people there 
um, yeah, there was always a little band of us somewhere. Wow. But um, I remember once somehow getting a date with one of the guys and I came back the following week and I let it be known that the guy and I had dated and he was ridiculed and it was, it was very difficult. It was very hard. Wow. So there was enough of a workplace culture that people were sort of keeping tabs on each other. Yes, absolutely. Wow. And so New York, Pratt meeting, I mean, could you just humor me and tell, tell me about meeting Greer Langton and how she came into your life? Because I'm such a Greer Langton fan too. You are. Yeah. Um, I'm standing on the corner and this little creature walks up next to me and says, aren't you Stephanie? And I said, yes. She says, I'm Greer. She says, I've heard so much about you because there were only two of us at Pratt. Mm -hmm. And ironically, one was white and well, one was black. And we became immediate friends. We became immediate friends. Um, she was very young. Greer was very young. She was very sweet. She wasn't platinum yet. She wasn't involved with drugs. She was a kid. She was just a kid, some really sweet little tiny kid from, <laughs> from nowhere, middle America. Yeah. You know, who had to grow up very, very fast. But she was darling. She was just really darling person. And I came to love her very much. And she, time went on. I love Pratt. She lived in the same building that Robert lived in. Uh, I think she became in, re involved with drugs mm -hmm. heavily. And she met Paul. She was part of Einstein. She was part of that gallery scene that yeah. exploded. Yes. But and you were friends throughout the years. Did you move to Manhattan as well? And is, this, living, is this the point when you kind of put the paintbrush away and focused on? I was living gas? in Brooklyn when I put the paintbrush away, yes. And I, somehow I managed to survive and find, I found odd jobs working in the food and wine industries. Mm -hmm. And I just survived. And gradually over a period of time, we went on with her life and I went on. We always stayed in touch though. Yeah. She was uh, extremely beautiful. She was very um, enterprising. She was very, she was much more ambitious than she appeared to be. If you were, if Greer walked into a room sooner or later, she stood out on top of the table. She, <laughs> somehow she got the attention that she, she loved being the, the star, the center of attention. She just did. Wow. She, she knew that she was extraordinary. And no one had ever seen anything like her before. No. Because usually, you know, typically trans people were always, well, clockable. You could tell that they were trans. Mm -hmm. And then Greer comes along and she looks like a porcelain doll. You know, you remind me of her. Oh. Very <laughs> You've been told that. You've been told that. I, I have been, yeah. Um, you know, what was it? What was it like witnessing her success in the eighties? And did you? What was going on in your life? You you had these parallel tracks. As... Um, I saw her become involved with drugs. I saw her gradually become more distant. I think that the drugs really just alienated her. Yeah. I really, really do. She became, uh, did you ever see the pictures of her and Paul getting married? Yeah, oh yeah, and Nan Golden photographs. Yeah. You're in some of that. I mean, you're in the wedding photos, but Nan, did Nan photograph you and Greer also in her apartment? Nan never photographed me. I don't think I was visible. Mm -hmm. I, I think 
as close as Greer and I were, the world was still divided into black and white. Mm -hmm. so, somehow I, I wound up like step and fetch it on, on the side. Mm -hmm. it, it, yes, it, I, I would be on the edge of a photograph. I was never, I was never allowed to really have a voice of my own, mm -hmm. you know? And so I went along with this. I was so used to being, we, we were taught to be submissive and to not, not don't, don't demand, don't ask, be quiet, be subservient, mm -hmm. you know? And so, and so Nan Golden, as much as, as much as she adored trannies, never took a single picture of me. And I was right there. I was young and beautiful too. But I think I was, I was just black. I didn't measure up to what they were looking for. Mm. But the whole standard of beauty was very different. You understand? Yeah. I, I wasn't. I wasn't white. I wasn't blonde. I was no longer young. And that that's that's just the way that it was, you know. And did you find you know? That that sounds like an alienating world for you to step into. Did you, what was happening in your life? Were you living, what was, what, what, how did your life open up? I, I was just, I was just surviving. Mm -hmm. At that point, the only thing that really interested me was learning the music. Mm -hmm. I spent a very great deal of time in bars, in clubs, learning uh, the music, jam sessions, rehearsals, learning the music. I had to learn it. I had to get it from somewhere and I got a really late start in this. Yeah. You know? And I just survived up until the time that I went to Pratt. I didn't complete the master's program. And I just worked at retail jobs for a long time. Yeah. Went out at night in clubs hung out. I get, gosh, I guess those little years were sort of uneventful, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> Not a great deal happened, really happened. Well, you made your way to San Francisco eventually. I did, yes. And when did you pick up the paintbrush again? When did yeah. art come into your life? Was it, I, or was it always happening? It, it was always there. Hold on, I came back, Chicago, Detroit. By the time I get back to California, I've begun painting again on my own mm -hmm. because uh, it requires a certain amount of time and space and expenditure to do this. But I, I never stopped loving it. Um, where did I come from? I was in Detroit, I wasn't painting then. Uh, in Chicago, I didn't paint there. I picked the I picked the brush up again when I came to California. Wow! And was there a catalyst? Was there a a, a reason or a, a journey to, to finding it? your way back to being an artist? No, it's just there. <laughs> it's just the brushes. You go into the art supply store, and before you know it. You've moved some things aside and set the paint up again. And <laughs> yeah. It's like a compulsion. It's like a kind of compulsion. So I didn't become a success or a star in the world of music or jazz. Um, oh, in my view, you, you are. <laughs> you, you know, I never told anyone that I was trans in the world of music. Out of all those gigs in Chicago, in Detroit, in New York, in Paris, there were people who, who, who could maybe discern or clock or find out later on or after the fact. But, but, I, but I never performed under the rubric of trans. Right. And I taught music for a a long, long time. But now I would like, now if I should perform again, I would like to perform under the rubric of trans. Yes. 
Yeah, come on. I don't have a great deal of sand left in the hourglass. <laughs> Maybe more than you think, though. You never know. You never know. <laughs> I, I, don't care. I don't care if the world knows now. I think yeah. the world should know now. Yeah, absolutely. And I wonder, Rebecca, is could we look at some of your photos? Because I, I think it's such a wonderful visual journey of, yeah. of your life. And I feel like it'd be, I also want to see some of your work and talk about what you're communicating and what you're expressing in this latest exhibition. Um, yeah. And I think that, I just thank you so right. much, Thanks. Stephanie, for your work and for the incredible sacrifices that you made to claw out space for yourself in a world that oh. has no space for us, you know? No, it is not. Okay. Keep talking for two minutes. <laughs> you got it. I, I don't feel so shut out now. I don't feel quite so alienated now. I don't feel so very marginalized. Well, now the world is caught up to you, you know, <laughs> but it's, well, it, it, kind of. it is this world because you've been creating it this whole time. Yes. Uh, I wish all of this had happened sooner. I'm no longer young and beautiful and svelte, but I'm still here. Well, I'm I think here. you're beautiful, darling. Well, you're a sweetheart to say that. <laughs> it's true. Resplendent, majestic, glamorous. Where are we? Okay, I am finding it. <laughs> I know I am. Yeah. I'm gonna find this. Um, and there is, yeah, I think a tremendous amount of change that's, that's happened in your lifetime that, that you embody, you know, that you are an embodiment of the change and the many ways in which perceptions of trans people have transformed over and over again. Yes. I'm gonna show you something too, Zach. I'm not sure if I oh, allow Zoom to share your screen. I'm so sorry, I did not prep this in advance because I didn't realize, oh. And I know we have a few people so, hanging out. So it is quit. I'm so Curtis, sorry. Aaron, I'm Nicholas, so Nikki, thank you all for joining. <laughs> Do you guys, if you, any of you want to chime in with questions in the chat, we should be able to read them. Um, okay, can you can you see these images? <laughs> Not very clearly. Yes, we see them. I see them. Yes. Is this your? This was taken in Greer. Oh, this is Greer's your dorm. Family. In Greer's dorm. Here, I have these ones that are a oh, little bigger. Okay. Well, here, this is, that's oh, there you, I am. that's you. What <laughs> age? Sorry, it's not straight. Um, maybe what 13 or, so or 12. This? And then let me see if I can, oh, wait. No, we're just, we're just gonna do, this is manual here, everybody. You know, Rebecca, I bet I, I have, you sent it to me. I know, I but it's something, it's telling me that if I wanna open it on my computer, I have to quit. And I don't want to press that button. Because... Oh, yeah. Don't quit. Not yet. We're not done yet. We're not it done scares yet. me to make that commitment. Well, I just found it. Here, here's a picture. It. Here's something you never saw. <laughs> oh, wow. Greer inside of her doll. Yes. That's the, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what was the name of that doll? That's the doll that she it's one of the fat dolls. would wear. Yeah, I think it was in her her apartment at one ninety five East Fourth. There's a zipper up the butt house, which is how she you, she was amazing. Yes, <laughs> insane girl. Wow. Did you ever see this? I have seen that. Yeah, that's a beautiful book. Absolutely. That's uh, Robert Vitale, whom Greer adored. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes, it was. 
that's about all that I have left on here pretty much. What would you like the earlier, the, the younger generations to know at this point in your life? What would I like the younger generation to know? To find a spiritual path. Mm. Yeah. I really, really do because I think that the trans thing is a spiritual journey as well. I think it's a social journey because we are defined by our social circumstances and yeah. by our, yes, you, you come and you are defined by who you are, by your race and by your gender and by your sex. And in, in, in the context of a larger society that says you have to, you have to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's, that's, that's unreal because the, because life is not, life is not binary like that. Yeah. Uh, I think to, I, I think it does matter what people say to a certain extent because mm -hmm. we, we live here with other people and we define how other people treat us and what they think of us. Um, I think it, I think it's karma. I, I think that it's not an accident that you are born in circumstances where you are persecuted or oppressed or stigmatized by your yeah. sex or gender. I, I think that's karmic. Mm -hmm. I think that it is a kind of debt that has to be paid. I, I don't think the debt has to be paid in blood. I just think that it's, I think, I think that there are less, I think that there are lessons you have to learn. If you are born into a world where the, where, where the world does not accept you or like you, your lesson is to find a way to learn those lessons and survive. Otherwise yeah. you wouldn't have that problem at all. Right. Yes. I think that there are far worse things than being born trans. I think trans can also be seen really as an opportunity to develop skills you just wouldn't get the chance to do otherwise. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry if it sounds like if this path sounds so difficult and challenging, but you know, guys, most of the good stuff really requires a challenge. Oh, oh, there's just there's no other way you can get to the fucking mountaintop. There's no other <laughs> way. There's no other way you can get there except through challenges. You know. No. I think we have to find as much <coughs> enjoyment as possible. To find as much enjoyment as possible in your life. You know. Yeah. And, and and to come to realize that you're more than just a label. You're you're not you're not what you're not. You you you're not somebody else's problem. Yeah. You can't be defined by what somebody else considers, what somebody else considers a problem. Mm -hmm. Or a menace, you know. Um. Yeah. And, and finally, you know, it it might be a privilege. I think it's something of a privilege to be born rare and different. And 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 your your feathers have a different color and your yes. <laughs> it's 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 I hate to say this, it's very, very often the sign of genius. You understand? Yeah. You, uh, of whatever sexual persuasion you may be, to be different is just a challenge. You, you, you may not be in, included in the inner circle. And so it, your challenge becomes to tell it, to reveal what happens to those who are not part of the circle, you mm -hmm. know, to see life from a different angle. My, my, I had one sister who was one year younger than me. 
I was born in 42, Patricia was born in 43. And for a long, long time, I envied her. She didn't have a, a gender problem or issue. She was pretty for a black girl. She was really quite pretty. And I just thought she didn't, she really, she was able to get married and have children. And now in retrospect, I'm, you couldn't give me her life on a platter. On yeah. A <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about that? She didn't get to do half the stuff, not a fraction of the stuff I did. She just stayed home and had them babies and stayed in Detroit and, oh. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. And Rebecca, if you could share, if you could allow screen sharing, I can show some photos and we could, okay. for, the, for the last few minutes, just check out some of the, I am the oh, images. All panelists. I think that okay. that that is just to respond to some of the things you're saying, Stephanie. It's like, um, oh yeah, here we go. All right. Thank you for figuring that. Oh out. my goodness, <laughs> of course. Hi. This is some of the stuff that was that's in the show. Yes. Why? This is the baby. That's the baby. I was a kid. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, something like that. This is in Greer's apartment in Pratt, Pratt Institute. Really? And this is the, the we had we had not long since met. Wow. That's a map of Pratt on my chest, yes. Wow. I, I, I was she was a lifesaver. Yeah. Yes. And did she take that picture of you? Uh, I think in her apartment. boyfriend at the time. Greer somehow managed to always have a boyfriend. Um uh what was it david i think her boyfriend david took the picture this wow. and the transformation between this and the next is astonishing this is pratt and this is paris right wow. Look at that. it's like what <laughs> happened to me well this is daytime and this is nighttime <laughs> it's just it's just an amazing shot it is it's truly Truly, yeah. Salt, sultry. Uh huh. This was the first CD I ever made in my life. Was with Michelle Grayer. It's not the most flattering picture. I did. I didn't. And in those days, I didn't have a. There were no stylists. Right. I had to kind of wing this on my own. You did your own makeup and styling. Your yeah. Makeup and stuff, and it wasn't always as successful as I would have liked. Still, um, this thing won, it won the Django door. This thing won a very, a, and they didn't know the tea either. And they were furious. They, were. <laughs> they had no idea they had given this, this esteemed award to this transgender person. Goddess. Mm -hmm. And this is, your that's where i live now your native habitat that's where i live now with the, paint, <laughs> the, the paint and the brushes and the goo and the ah oh. <laughs> it's really 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 but but you can see how deeply moved i am by images absolutely this is the montage of your life yes this is quite new this is a painting i just finished working yeah. there's the paint this isn't this is from maybe a year or two or something ago. Yeah. And, and, and so it's much less evolved than the work that's in the current show at, at Rebecca's. Mm. Um, but there we have some of the new work in here. Yes. Wow. But just, this go, is in the go, exhibition. Okay, go back one. Yes. It's just like the difference between Pride Institute. No, go back one yes, to the, the, the first watercolor. Oops. Between, this one? It's the difference between, let's call this Pratt. Mm -hmm. Go down two paintings. Yeah. And this is where I am now. Right. So, and a, yes. I went in a very short period of time. I went from something that could be called representational all the way to abstraction. Mm. This is my first foray into acrylic painting. 
but quilling was is that something of a challenge for me mm -hmm. i like it i love still lives i had yeah. i hadn't quite gotten my feet wet with acrylics and i'm struggling a little here i like it so keep i think it's i think it's fabulous oh thank you okay it becomes get 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 more abstraction yeah abstraction looks is the most deceptive thing in the world <laughs> like all you have to do is just throw some paint onto a surface oh uh -huh. keep going that you know sometimes i'm not sure yes but but watercolor <laughs> is just so it has it has a life of its own yeah it, it takes on its it takes on its own it's like it has a will of its own right so keep going do you feel like um this stage of your work is about visual pleasure is it finding the kind of um aesthetic beauty and simplicity and in, in the process yes i do but i also but in looking at this kind of present work i also see how i i really like it, it it stages it's like between the, the the first watercolors that we saw to the current show and and how much for how much farther i have to go mm -hmm. you know it's really I'm out there on, in the East Bay in Oakland all by myself in my in my robe and my coffee. And it's really hard to get motivated sometimes, guys, you know? <laughs> it really is. Yeah. And so, and so I'm a, I'm a little lazy. I know that I should work harder. But at the same time, I see so much promise. You know, I see yeah. a great deal. I would love to work bigger. I, I, I would love to work in six, with six foot paintings. And yeah. I, I think it's some, somehow I will get to that point. I need to explore all this. Take, I need to take all this, as they say, to the next level. And yeah. I shall, and I shall. But it's beautiful. I agree. Absolutely. Who would have thought that the woman in the sequin dress would have got... <laughs> You know, <laughs> oh my goodness, the the woman in the sequence dress always has, uh, you know, tricks up her sleeve. Yes, I would say it's always got some secret superpowers. The power, but I, but I love it, beauty. and now I realize I'll never, I'll never lay the brush down again. It's just, it's wonderful. It's hard, you know. It's it painting is oh, it's not for. It's a challenge to do that. Yeah. It's not like putting on lipstick, honey. It's just not. It's, a, <laughs> it's, it's, an, it's an exploration. Yeah. It's an endless search, an endless, never ending search. I think the hardest part of it is you have to be willing to make mistakes. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm very much aware of the cost of paint and paper and the nice brushes. And will this sell or is this any good? No. You know, and I am my own worst critic. This too is new. It's beautiful. The, the paintings are so strong. The colors are so strong and deep and dark. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What's the next one? Uh, I believe it's you on stage. Me on stage. I did a show at at a California Jazz Conservatory. Almost no one came. That's Joe Warner. He reached a point where he didn't want to perform with me anymore. We had worked together several years. We were at the cheese board once a month for several years. He was also the pianist for Faye Carroll, another prominent vocalist here in the area. And he learned all he needed to learn. Yeah. And he learned a lot. I did too, of course. But yeah. he, I, I taught him a lot. Wow. 
Almost no one came to that gig. There were just a few people in the audience. Was it a COVID era? It was not COVID yet. So it must no. have been in 2019. Wow. And Stephanie, as we wrap up, was there was there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to address or any revelations in the process to share? Well, <laughs> let me ask you, what are you doing the rest of your life? <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm gonna uh, shake things up, stir things up, make some magic. Uh, I'm going to learn as much as I can. I'm going to gather as much information as I can and disseminate it as widely as possible. I am going to seize the moment. I am going to um, absolutely get as much pleasure as I can yes. from life. <laughs> I'm going to love freely without abandon, no matter how many times my heart gets pulverized and I will create art in your um, footsteps. Did, did you learn anything from our session here? Absolutely. Oh my goodness. So many things. Okay. Yeah. I love the um, visceral, you know, it's so vivid imagining Detroit in the 60s being trans at the Chrysler factory. <laughs> that moment when everything else is a dream, when everything is in front of you. Still, I think those are just the magical kind of moments in life. That... It, it, it was, it's like, there was one moment, I was away a year. I was after the surgery, I was out on sick leave a year. And at some point they told me, look, you, you either come back or you, you lose your job. And I'll never forget, I had to go back, enter the factory, and the whole world knew. So I had, I've had to face that kind of, I won't call it censure, that kind of spotlight, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And live through that and live to tell it. You know, I guess you could say it was a kind of censure. Hmm. But I think I'm all the stronger for it. I really do. Yeah. Because now I realize it really is just part of the journey. It, they, don't, they don't know half of what they, they think they know. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they don't know, Zachary. They, people, they don't know. People don't know. People have to be educated. That's true. Informed. They have to be educated and informed, and we've all been terribly misinformed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's heavy. You know. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's it's. I mean, I think that being open, being porous, being flexible, um, being uh, curious. Yes. Trying to gain knowledge, trying to, you know, understand things that you don't understand, trying to understand people that you disagree with. Um, I, th I think the thing that made me, quote unquote, different, the thing that moved me to the, the that, that continuously, continuously kept me from entering this circle was curiosity. Mm. I wasn't a particularly effeminate child. I just think I was curious. Yeah. And I think part of that curi part of that curiosity came out of being well literate. Mm. The, the, the thing that the, the black man lacked in the movie. Uh, yes. We, we, we know that this individual, we know that he's following a stereotype, but what makes him a stereotype is that he's absolutely devoid of curiosity. You, you can't conceive of such, yes, you can't conceive of such a person expressing a desire to learn to read or speak better or see what's over the hill or go to another culture mm -hmm. because they're devoid of intellect and they're devoid of intellect because they have no curiosity. Right. Does that make sense? Of course. Oh, absolutely. 
Yeah. And some people are happy in that place of ignorance, I think, but um, we can't know what we don't know. And it takes curiosity to curiosity. get us there. Yeah, to get us to venture yeah, out yes. and to expand yeah, our consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. I hope we meet again. I would love to. Oh, my goodness. I'm Where are you living? Los Angeles. Okay, you're in LA. And I'm long overdue for a trip to San Francisco. So on my next visit, I will certainly be finding you in Oakland. Yes. <laughs> That'll be I would love that. Yes. And then you can see how much I truly look like Greer Langton in person. <laughs> yes, I know. Yeah. Well, so thank you, darling. Thank you all for being here, for the folks who joined and for the folks in the future watching this. Because I know that this will be a historical Take record. Yourself. Yeah. Take care, Zach. You too, Stephanie. Thank you, Rebecca, for everything. And thank you so much. It's been have so a wonderful fun. night. Be able to do this. You too. My Good pleasure. Night. Bye, darling. Thank you. Bye. Bye.